Productions. This is podcast number three. And today's segment, we're going to talk about attitude and perspective. To uh, begin the podcast, I'm going to remind everybody the goal of executive coaching or career coaching that I've done for many years is to lower the time, decrease the pain and suffering or the lack of knowledge and to increase the revenue. So I bring best of practice, excuse me, best practice, subject matter expertise, new technologies that we can use to help you keep your job and do well there and also to get a great job. Not just a job, not just a good job, but a great job. Today, I'm going to mention um, a um, service I've been using for a while. It's like LinkedIn, but it's an, actually an AI platform called lunchclub.ai. Lunchclub.ai. And what it does is it is actually, and it's been around for a while, and it matches you up kind of like a Tinder for business discussions. And what I do is I've, I've been actually, I was one of the founding people using it. You have to be referred by it. So any of you that are interested in it, please send me a message or, and I'll, uh, I can refer you to it. You can refer as many people as you want, but it's kind of referral based, but it allows me to talk to up to three people a week that are in common interests that I have. So my settings are in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. That's where primarily a lot of my coaching has occurred. And more like topics that I'm interested in. So you can pick more business-related topics. So uh, that leads me into what I was going to initially, instead of talking about the attitude and perspective, I'm going to start with three conversations I had this week. And they were all related to lunchclub.ai. They're all prearranged, kind of like a scheduler. I don't know if you've used Calendly. It's like calendar, but with Calendly. And that schedules times for you. So Lunch Club has a similar thing. So I had three calls this week. And question, uh, the irony is my profile shows that I'm, I'm, I'm a, a coach for career transition. And... So almost everybody who links with me and wants to talk to me has me has questions about coaching, uh, you know, some element of coaching and not just coaching, but actually trying to get a job or how to change jobs. So I thought, um, why not uh, talk about those people? And I'm going to talk to them in broad terms so that, you know, no confidentiality is revealed about them. But the uh, the first one was a. He was a senior manager at a technology company, (coughs) excuse me, in uh, Washington, D.C. area, in the metropolitan area. And he was interested in becoming a a chief technology officer or CIO. And he he really, he basically asked, well, I'm really trying to do this. And he really didn't have a plan. So I suggested it to him. Pretty simply, like a lot of people have a job they want and they they think by working harder or getting better at their craft, they're going to get the job. That's probably 20 or 30 percent of it. 70 percent of it is actually knowing about the job you're going for. So in his case, he wanted to be a chief technology officer of a small company with, say, two to three, two to four hundred employees. In the, in the space of Washington, D.C., which would be primarily defense contractors, government contractors, service companies. So I recommended him to find some meetings where they meet and go attend them, even though he's not at that level yet. I mentioned going on LinkedIn and having conversations with people that are doing it now. I said, why not pick a target, a target date in the future? and Pick a date that you want to be a CTO by. And a a realistic target would be 18 months. And then work backwards. Good planning usually means you set a goal. You don't take little bites every day. You actually set a goal 
and you realize the major things that have to occur before you get the position, and you actually work many things in parallel, and you accomplish them sometimes in parallel so that you can then get those position, get that position. I, uh, he was very receptive to that. He's actually going to be communicating with me in about six months. He's going to start working on it. So that's underlying all these things is an attitude and perspective. That's why I'm leading with these questions today from, uh, from lunchclub.ai, excuse me, lunchclub.ai. I have another call. It's with a uh, professional, actually I call, is a professor at a university in the South. And he teaches at a university, but he wants to, uh, because of the schools getting smaller and they're not getting as many cli uh, uh, writing classes, he's a writer. He wants to transition in to be a technical writer or an editor. Already he edits a book like for 10 or 15 years that a, a successful author uh, in the US. So he's been an editor for a while. So he had he actually had to take a job as a customer service representative to make to get make ends meet while he was as a professor because just to make money. So I actually, I mean, I just did some research on it and I've hired technical writers. I've helped technical writers. I've helped editors get jobs. I've helped proposal writers get jobs, uh, directors of proposal management. So he has a specialty in a couple of different industries. And I said, well, reach out to technical writers in that area, in that industry on LinkedIn, have a conversation with, go see him, go see him in the region. He's in the South near Alabama and Georgia, go meet with the people, go to groups with it. And part of it is people, he's been applying and the same thing with the manager that wants to be CTO, they're applying and they're not getting any response. And so they think there's no opportunities out there. So the writer is gonna start doing that. Um, I think he has a great, great possibility. He needs to customize his LinkedIn and his resume to reflect the position he's going for and the industry he's going for. And then the third one was, I forgot what it was. It was, I have, oh, I have a uh, gentleman in Chicago who is a senior manager in accounting firm, a big four firm. That's like uh, Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Anderson, I think Anderson Consulting, even though they don't have accounting anymore. But he's a senior manager and he wants to become a partner. So I, uh, a lot of people, again, focus on working harder, doing a better job, and not working on, in this case, politics. And politics, I always say politics with a small p. Politics with a big p is like government politics, regional politics, like elections and stuff like that. But politics with a small p is knowing how to uh, have a good relationship with your boss. That could be, uh, I always, I keep everything real simple. I say, what are the five things your boss wants you to do? What are the five things your boss doesn't want you to do? What are the five things that are the core of your job? And if you do all those things, and then if you can find out what are the five things your boss likes, really focus on that and you'll you'll be doing a good job your boss will think you're you'll be better than your peers that work for him and if you're trying to get into your position of your boss or at that level then don't envy the position go find people in the position and show yourself friendly and you'll have friends go make friends with these people show an interest in them ask them about their background got what got them to their position and learn from them what got them to the next step. It's not a crapshoot a lot of times. A lot of times people think, well, they just got so lucky they got the promotion. But the politics meeting where you're actually engaging in communications and relationships with people that are successful above you, if you want a job above you. And then a lot of times people are envious of one, one person that is the favorite of the boss. And I say, well, then go befriend that person, find out why is he the favorite of the boss. And a lot of times it's little things. He stays late. He takes on rough, rough projects. 
he goes hits golf balls with them once a week. Uh, whatever it is, it could be just being uh, available. Some I work for a great woman in uh, Washington D.C. and she never wanted you to talk for more than two minutes. Uh, she was a director. Uh, very busy. She had four boys under the age of uh, 12. She's being a mom and her husband had a job. And I just knew she didn't mind me asking about her boys and what sports they were playing and what they were doing. And I was very responsive to her. When she texted me, I immediately responded or she emailed me. And I always had a good attitude. I always asked her if there's something I could do. And I did. I wasn't any, any more work than anybody else to do. It was just being aware of the pressure she had under her life and not like focusing on me, but focusing on what she needed. So that was the main thought. Those are the three people I talked to this week. It was, a, it was actually very enjoyable. And now I'd like to talk about attitude and perspective. I call these the, the silent, probably the silent things that hurt people the most when they're looking for work or trying to do better at their job. It's many, many years of talking to people about the, the obvious things they want to know, how to make their resume better, how to make their LinkedIn work, how to network, how to get in front of people, uh, how to apply, how to interview, how to negotiate. But throughout this process, I call the silent one, the, the one that nobody ever thinks about is having the right attitude and having the right perspective. Um, I think I'm going to start with, I don't know, perspective or attitude. Um, I think I'll start with perspective. Then we'll get to attitude. So approaching your job or approaching the next job you have, you want a balanced pr perspective. You've got to know that there's plenty of jobs out there. There's plenty of jobs in plenty of industries and plenty of sub-industries. Everything always, is always changing. Industries are arising. Industries are dying. The, there are jobs out there at all levels, at the highest levels, at the medium level, and at the lowest level. And so you have to go into it knowing there are jobs, especially with companies with 500 to 5,000 employees. Everybody focuses on Apple and Google and the large defense contracts. So they don't think of the hundreds of smaller companies that support them that do better jobs. A lot of times they're more, uh, not loyal, but they're they don't do layoffs usually. Smaller companies tend to be very much more stable. And I mean small, again, even 500 or 100 to 500. Plenty of companies I know, owners in D.C. from being in the business up there, a lot of the small companies are still around. They're a lifestyle business for the owners. In other words, they keep it because they like doing that job and they keep the business around that size. So that's an important perspective that there are plenty of jobs out there. You really need to be quick to listen when you're talking to people about jobs and uh, talking to people about opportunities. A lot of times people want to talk about what where they're going through, where they are, but really it's about the people on the other side that have the positions within the companies and you want to hear what they say so you, so you know what's going on. So uh, I call it, you have to be positive and quick to listen have a positive attitude. Nobody wants to hear about what went wrong, how it's going wrong. It's really, in all aspects of the communication, it needs to be positive. Why do you like your company? What's going on? How did you get your position? I love the school you went to. How do you do that having two kids at home? How do you do that commuting all the time? Get, try to be upbeat about questions. Perspective also is you need to talk to hiring managers and, and decision makers, not recruiters. Recruiters don't have any time. They are they have very specific jobs. They're very busy. The better ones know exactly what they're looking for. And they'll be polite a lot of times, but the hiring manager and the decision makers, especially if they're, I call it people like me, if they are like I'm an engineer, I was an engineer trained, I was a naval officer. I did program management, and project management for the government. So I would go find other people with Navy background, with uh, engineers or work for engineering firms. I would go find these people and talk to them and ask them questions about opportunities, about what they know. They're the ones you want to talk to. Most people, 
need to think about three things. How you see the working world, how the working world sees you, and how you see yourself relative to the working world. So if you have a healthy perspective knowing the working world needs project managers that are ex-Navy guys in certain areas, certain parts of the company, country, I'm not going to go up to Niagara Falls, New York, and say, wow, I can't get any jobs up here. They don't hire Navy guys here. Go to, I don't know, to create, you know, I don't know where, uh, Indianapolis and say, well, they aren't hiring Navy, ex-Navy guys here. You're obviously going to go to need to go where the industry is present in a Navy city. I'm, a, I'm in Virginia Beach in a, a Navy city, in a place where they have a large Navy, naval facility or a defense facility. So know how the working world sees you know how you that's seeing the working world make sure you are presenting yourself well how's the working world seeing you do you present yourself well do you have a positive attitude and how you see yourself i have know your skills know how to communicate your skills have a good attitude um know how that relates to somebody trying to find uh, uh, somebody to work for most people don't know their industry or details about their industry. Most people don't know about their sub-industry, the sub-industry they work in. Knowledge of that is critical to really be able to change jobs. And most people change jobs every, most everyone changes job between two to five years like clockwork. You can set a clock fire. But most people come on a, up on that time with a lot of anxiety and fears because they haven't done the homework that just a little bit at a time and you would be ready for it. Every company, one of the things perspective wise, most people, uh, again, every company has eight components. Those components are, or I don't know, I might miss one of them, but basically just like if you think of my friend had this limo business up in uh, outside of Baltimore called Tip Top Limousine and he was the owner, but he had the, the core business of a limousine business is their drivers. So that's important for a defense contracting business. It's the analysts and the people that support whatever the defense contracting business is for an accounting firm. It's accountants. So if you're an IT guy or an IT woman or network person in a accounting firm, or if you're a accountant in a defense contracting firm, or you're the accountant in the limousine company, you're not going to be the top priority. You're probably not going to get paid the best. You're not going to be the most important person. So a lot of times when you're you're in your career, you need to make sure what kind of firm it is. Plenty of people I've coached have been in large accounting firms or large uh, consulting firms, maybe in technology, maybe in certain areas, and they weren't compensated real well. And that industry, like just like the large finance companies, Capital One, Capital One rewards technology and it rewards finance people. So they're you're, they're always going to be the ones that get promoted. They're always going to be the ones that make the most money. So this is pretty much the same at every uh, job and every position. So that's one thing you need to think about. It's not critical, but something you need to think about. Know where you are today. This is all perspective we're talking about. Know where you are today. Do you need a job? Are you looking for improving your job? Are you looking to move or relocate? Are you looking for a career change? Are you looking for an ideal job? Are you looking for a dream job? You're looking for a, a little better job. You have a job and you want a little better job. You're looking for a good job. You're looking for a great job. Most uh, when people are looking for work, you know, need to know your situation so you can communicate your situation and actually plan it out and think through the steps you need to do to get that. Uh, let's see. One of the things I'd like to talk about, about perspective. Oh, actually, I'm going to move into, uh, let's see. Let's talk about this. I have a great story. I am the master storyteller. I want to talk about perspective. So when, we were, when I lived in Columbia, Maryland, we had we had large townhouses and a lot of people lived. We were right near the, the Columbia Mall there. And a couple moved in with a young child, and he was a financial analyst. He had come from Nashville. His wife was a SEC 
it's a federal organization lawyer. She had gotten a good job there. And he was a senior financial analyst, just moved into the Baltimore area looking for work. And I suggested to him, I said, well, it's going to be kind of hard to find a financial analyst position in Baltimore right now because uh, it was Alex Brown, I think, is the company. Uh, yeah, Alex Brown was a large investment company in Baltimore, laid off 5,000 analysts that like two weeks before he moved in there. So I was talking to him and he actually had a law degree also. He had spent time in mergers and acquisitions. That's the working with companies that buy and sell, like as a lawyer, where you help them negotiate the deals and buy the companies and sell the companies. And I had a relationship with uh, the senior management, actually the executives at uh, Howard University. And the actually chief of staff under the uh, president was a friend of mine. So while I was talking to him once, I said, you know, I have this guy, he's got a law degree and he's, and I knew Howard at the time was expanding over all of the Northeast part of uh, DC around Florida Ave. They, were, they, done, they did an amazing job. That's an amazing university, one of my favorite universities. And uh, so he ended up uh, connecting him and he actually worked with him for the university to help do merger and acquisition related to businesses and properties that they were buying up in the uh, north uh, east part of uh, Washington, D.C. And the interesting thing is he had many skills, but he was saying, well, I need this kind of job, but you have to know the territory, what's out there, where is it? Is the economy down in this area? You might not be able to get a job there, but you might be able to get something else because of your skill set. He had great analytical skills. He was a great communicator. He presented well. He was sharp. He was experienced. So a lot of people would sit there and say, I can't find an analyst job where you have to step back and then analyze and think through some of your other skills and which, which ones are marketable. Great story. I know I'm, I'm an amazing uh, storyteller. So let's see. One of my jokes I used to say a lot was when I was uh, young and growing up in uh, Wellesley and Natick, Massachusetts, we lived, when we lived in Natick, I lived on a uh, a lake, and uh, my brother and I, my friend Billy Sullivan, we used to uh, sail all the time, all the time, sail. We were sailing all kinds of little sailboats on lakes, and then when I moved down to Washington, D.C. and started going to the school, a uh, good friend of mine, Jorge Pena, shout out to Utah, I love Jorge, he lives in, uh, near uh, Park City. Uh, he and I bought this sailboat together because we had aspirations of racing it against all the Chesapeake Bay out of Annapolis. And we fixed it up. We painted it. I think we called it Caluche. I think it means ghost ship in Spanish. And we painted it on the side. Well, we got out there to race and it was sinking because we had painted it. It was wooden. We thought we had sealed it. But as long as we were moving fast, it wasn't sinking. Anyway, there was, again, Olympic racers in Annapolis. And we were like engineering students sailing a sailboat one, you know, one half a day, once a week on the bay right there. It's about an hour and a half drive from D.C. and racing. And we ended up losing every race, every race. We were in the we were way in the back and we were like we had read about it. We you know, we knew what kind of boats. But again. You had race teams there that were sponsors. They had the top technology, top gear. They would just smoke us. So eventually we just decided to sail around all the time just for fun. And we never raced again. We, I think we only did two races. So here we had aspirations of placing with the best racers out of Annapolis. And we had done our homework. We didn't have good gear. We didn't prepare. We didn't spend the time doing it. We didn't, we were kind of landlocked in DC. There's a river there, but you really can't race or sail there. So you have to manage your expectations and manage your things. We just, we handled it well. We made, you know, we just decided, oh, we're not racing anymore. We realized we were sinking at the start because you have to start the race, a sailboat race, you start real slow, we'll be sinking. And we had to keep moving or it would sink. So, so anyway, I know another great story from Bob. Let's see, let's talk about attitude a little bit. It's one of my favorite topics. And a lot of times I don't talk about it because people are very sensitive about this area. And But someone with a great attitude is going to be positive. 
they're going to be listening. They're going to be uh, attentive. And a lot of times I say they're diplomatic. So what does diplomatic mean? Because in D.C. we have a lot of diplomats and a lot of parts of the country that have diplomats. So a diplomat is someone who listens and can listen in their language. Like, um, and that they, when I, when I was uh, visiting a party at the Chinese embassy, and please don't, uh, you know, it's not a big deal. It was just a friend of mine was invited to the Chinese embassy before the Beijing Olympics. We went up there. It's a huge building. Went in there for this, uh, just a little networking thing. And they had Chinese, uh, they did have Chinese food there. It was amazing. And a lady came out and she was Chinese and she didn't speak English. And I could tell she was looking for the restroom. I had just come to the restroom. So I kind of bowed a little bit and I just used my hand and I got a, not real close to her, but a little close to her. And I motioned to her that it was right over there. And she bowed and she went on and she went into the restroom. So even though I didn't speak the language, I was respectful. I kept my distance. I was soft spoken. And that's what diplomacy is, is most everyone is worried about themselves when they're interviewing. If you actually are more concerned about the other person, then you won't be nervous. You'll be thinking about them. You'll be listening hard. You won't be thinking about your questions so much. And it, it makes things so much better. You've got to speak the language of the industry you're interviewing with. People will come from technology and try to get into, like, people don't understand cryptocurrency. They want to get into that business. So they want to get into cybersecurity and they know just computers. So learn the language. Again, nowadays you can listen to podcasts, read, and you can learn and get certifications of the industries that you're, you might be able to, like nowadays, mortgage industry is down. So learn the language of another industry so you can change industries and change well. Be humble, but still aggressive. So I believe be diplomatic, uh, know your industry, be professional. I'm not like professionally dressed. Um, I'm kind of like, I don't know, dressed nice, like cas casually, but I always try to dress nicer when I'm meeting with people. But still be aggressive. You can still be humble. Humble is being contrite, but also you can still be aggressive. Ask the questions. Go meet with them. Ask them to do things for you. Also be a nurturing parent. A nurturing parent listens to their child, uh, responds, responds in short answers. Not a demanding parent, not a demanding child. Think of being a nurturing parent when you're engaged with someone that you don't know. So that's kind of um, attitude to me is probably the most important thing. I evaluate that a lot when I'm talking to people. A lot of people are uh, open to discussion about it, but I try to coax them into the right perspective, also by leading by example. And then perspective, know that you have a lot of opportunities, that you have uh, a great, you know, you, you have abilities that have been given you and experience and be able to communicate those things to people, but also be more about them. You should be talking, perspective-wise, you should be talking about 40 to 45% of the time. The other person should be talking a majority of the time. I always end a conversation or a meeting. I usually, and everybody knows this from being around me, is I ask people, and I got this from my wife. I was a great thing. At dinner, we always said, what are the three things you learn, or three good things that happened at school? We always asked the kids when we were having dinner. And I would ask, I always ask people when I'm with them, even people that I'm not coaching, I would say, well, what are three things that you got out of our conversation today? What are three highlights? And everyone has three things. And it's great to end on that thing, end on those things, because that's what you're going to think about. Okay, wow, I did get that. I did learn that. I am, I am be able to do that. And I think be willing to engage and to be forthright um, in your conversations. One of the gentlemen I talked to today, he was uh, he was uh, appreciative of me asking him to just kind of, I, I call it getting your ask on, like be willing to set goals. Like everybody sets goals in every other area of their life, but they don't set goals and hard goals when they're looking for a position or Maybe when you're getting certifications and stuff, but rarely it occurs to people set hard goals and be active, to be proactive. You have plenty of time uh, to do that. And so I, I encourage you, 
this is, uh, I went almost exactly 30 minutes this time. I'm probably going to start having some people on to interview. I'm actually thinking of interviewing someone who got a job and the process she went through to get her job. Um, that's a possibility the next couple of weeks. And I'll probably uh, pick some other topics. But the attitude and perspective really rang clearly with me this week when I was talking to people. The economy's down, the political situation. The, so there's no jobs out there. But if you think about the jobs, and they always release the job reports, but again, that's the Department of Labor. That's their metric. But if you think about not just you know unemployment's up, but it's I always think of employ, how many people are employed, not how many are unemployed. A lot of times it's 90, 95, 96% of people are, are employed, and it's only a small percent that are unemployed. And if you actually do a little reading on industries, you can find out what industries don't have enough people or that are hurting in areas. They need accountants. They need technology people. They need, uh, uh, I've been talking to a lot of product managers and a lot of social media and marketing people, and they're having trouble finding work, but they aren't looking outside the industries they're familiar with. They aren't looking locally. They aren't going to smaller businesses and actually talking to people. So hope this was good for you. I tried to change up the format a little bit. Um, I really enjoy communicating this and feel free to comment. I'm always trying to improve and look forward to talking to you. Hopefully it'll be next week. Podcast number four, it'll be a mystery podcast. I'm not sure what the topic is yet, but I'm sure it'll be exciting. So have a great week. Take care. Bye.